As they went on and started doing things, I remember um, watching their whole, just kind of on the sideline, watching the whole fellowship thing unfold. Um, you could say there was a bit of envy in that. Um, you know, I saw them traveling the world. You know, every time I'd see them, I'd be like, oh, you know, I could have been part of that. You know what I mean? Um, and I ended up um, working um, for a woman who was the mother of one of my real good friends from junior high, that same junior high I went to. Uh, for performing arts magnet um, I ended up working for his mom who was a uh, she was a vice president of um, arts relations and promotion for this record label named private music um, I ended up becoming the director of uh, arts relations development basically her assistant um, but it was a, it's an adult contemporary label so they had artists their big artist is Yanni not hip-hop <laughs> Um, but they had some cool artists like Taj Mahal, Leon Redbone, they later signed Etta James. So um, they partnered and when House of Blues opened, I had carte blanche access to House of Blues. So I was in the music industry, but I was so, I was away from where my heart was. So, and it's so funny because I remember like, I would live for these little cameos I got. Like I remember um, I ended up moving to um, Marvin Avenue um, in uh, LA 90016 area, and I ended up living down the street um, from um, Lance and Youssef, uh, um, you know, Nuka and uh, uh, Youssef um, Nance, the Nance. Um, and they were working on the first Project Blowed project. You know, and I remember hearing mixed tapes, and I was like, <sighs> like, you know, people talk about, and no disrespect, Jay Dilla is my favorite producer of all time. But if you heard some of the basement nonce shit, they give Dilla a run, dude. Like, I have cassettes of some of their stuff. He used to, um, they used to make beats, and his speaker was like, you know, literally a speaker box that should be in the back of a truck. It was in his bedroom, like a, a, a speaker box from a truck in his bedroom. That, so it was all bass. It was like, <laughs> no trouble. Like, and he would make beats with that. He had an S900 and you know a, a little sampler and they would he, literally I would watch him make a record he would literally he had like I had like a couple thousand records like crates stacked double high a whole wall he had in his closet just like enough records from here to here like leaning in his closet and he would pull it out and it would be something and he put it on and it would be like, <laughs> you hear that crackle and then he'd be like, well, like, he was big into like, like that kind of bomb squad stuff, like Nance, uh, Youssef, and, and, and Nuka. They liked that, that, the ambient sound that a lot of people think, little squeaks and squeals. And, and man, they would play some track. I used to go to his kid, to their house. They live literally on the same block, like seven houses down. I would walk halfway down the block and be at their apartment. And I lived in this little house I was renting at the end of the top of the street. I would go down there like a kid in the candy store and just sit there and listen to their tracks. Like, and I'm like, I'm a producer. Like, I had ADATs in my living room and like, I had equipment. Like, they would come to my house. And they, it's funny because they looked up to me because of Sunshine Man and my influences. And, you know, they were younger. And I looked at them like, y'all on, on one and y'all don't even know. Like, y'all. And I heard mixtapes and it was like, mixtapes to me was like their Sunshine Man. It was like their anthem track that came out. And I was like, Y'all just banging over here, like, oh, this is dirty and ridiculously good. Like, you know, in every track. And then that's when me and Green started to develop as an MC. He wanted to MC and he was messing around with Voodoo and Bird and them. And they would come over and get on a nonce track and be like, I would lose my mind. Like, he had a track called Coming Live. They were so good, I wanted to take the money I was making in my job and put their records out. And that's kind of what I fell into as a role. Like, let me, just give me access to your music, I want to release it. And that's when I released the High School Dropouts 12 inch. You know, like I, I just went and put my money. I was like, I, I still know the machine. Let me put y'all out. Let me make a record label, Beats and Rhymes Records, and I just want to put y'all do stuff out. You know what I mean? And needless to say, none of it really sold. None of it really did, you know, I wasn't putting the hustle down. I was still day jobbing and trying to be doing a million things and keep my career, I had to keep the career safe. I never took the risk of losing my career. So, but I mean, I, I, 
that's how I, I, I re-channeled. You know, I stopped writing necessarily, and I, I still kind of produced. So there were, there were guys still coming to my I was still the place to go if somebody needed a beat and stuff. I remember Bird came on my house once, and I saw Bird flourish, and he left the nest and went and did his thing. I mean, um, I remember Voodoo came to my house for the first time. He did. He dropped the track. I, you know, I had ADATs, you know, which was like, it was like a big VCR that taped eight track. You know, and I had two of them because Ganja got a deal with Palace Entertainment, which was a Japanese owned company. And they just threw money at him. And they was like, we'll pay 5000 a track. And so Ganja got to pick his producers. So he picked me to do, he picked me and D to do a track. And that gave us five grand. The ADATs were uh, two grand a piece with tax and everything else on it. So we bought two ADATs. You know what I mean? So um, that's what we were just like, you know, I would always get the newest equipment and, you know, we just kept on it and kept. And so I was compiling these things. Ganja actually in that palace deal, he built that that same thing we were offered for um, um, by Steve Rifkin's company. Ganja kind of did it like he took the, some front money and built a studio in his house. He bought two ADATs. He bought a mixer. He had like a DAT machine to mix down to and he recorded his whole album in his bedroom. And I pretty much engineered half of it, you know what I mean? So I knew how to work it. I helped him set it up, I, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I became that kind of ancillary go-to guy in, in, around the circles. Like everybody, Sumi knows how to do beats. Sumi knows how to hook that up. Sumi took engineer and he knows how to do that. Sumi knows, put it, give him the headphones, so, you know what I mean? So I was that dude, you know what I mean? Like I was less, and every now and then, you know, um, and stuff is separate, we, we, we decided to do another compilation thing, the first brigade. I don't know if you heard of that. That was Ganja. Yeah, I knew about that. But right. That's what my question so, was. So, yeah, yeah, First Brigade, that was another compilation attempt. You know, we were trying to put that together. That never came to flourish, but all that happened in the same area. So we recorded a ton of tracks with who, all those guys. Who was all involved in First Brigade? Um, it was me, Ganja, Torch, uh, Massey, uh, Mass Kayla. Um, God, who am I forgetting? Who am I forgetting? I'm feeling so bad. I'm forgetting dudes. <laughs> There's somebody else I'm forgetting. I'll think of it, I'll think of it, it's slipping my mind. But yeah, I mean, we did the same thing. I outlined the timetable, I outlined the budget, exact same formula. I was like, let's do this, dude. You see what we did with the fellowship thing, let's do this thing, you know, had the meeting, you know, all these things, you know, and um, I was even to the point of, I had business plans, I had ways to pitch it for money, I, had, I mean, I was so good behind the scenes and trying to, I was like, I was trying to bring the professional world into this street world. And it was like, I constantly, you know, we're running to the, oh, James, it's these meetings. I don't understand what, what we do. We just want to record, you know, like, and I used to tell guys, dude, the recording is like 1% of the equation. Like we can all record forever. I can make a million songs. Like I do, I have, so, I have a garage full of like tracks, uh, like four tracks. I mean, I have like literally, you know, cassette upon cassette, each one with like three tracks or four track stuff on it. Since I was a kid, all the way till, you know, the modern time, I had, you know, discs from samplers that I've gotten rid of, long since got rid of the sampler. I have discs of stuff, tracks I've made. But we, you gotta sell it, you gotta market it. You gotta, you know what I mean? So I look today and I see like all, how easy it is. Like you can basically be broke if you got a laptop, you can do everything. You could be on iTunes in a day. 24 hours, you could make a record and release it all from your living room, not have to go nowhere. I'm from the world of like literally going in trying to get, uh, you know, pressing a distribution deal, talking to distributors, getting laughed out the room. I've had dudes tell me, no, you got to put like titties on the front cover and you got to have like a limousine in the front with the chalice with the diamonds on it. That's what's blowing up, homie, the Master P stuff. Like I saw that whole thing from here. I saw Master P from down there get to where he's at. I remember um, disc makers used to hype, um, what's his name, um, what's that cat name? Uh, Shake your ass, show me what you're working with. Mystical. Mystical was a, he was a disc makers artist. He went to disc makers and pressed his shit up. Then blew up. And then he signed a jive and became mystical that we all know. But literally, he's one of the dudes in the booklet. Like, was like, look at this guy from the South, from New Orleans, mystical. And I used to be like, look at this ghetto ass dude. You know what I mean? Like, there was our ego thing going, like, who are these people? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, so all of that, like, all of these, th the world is small. 
And it was just like the hustlers. It was to the hustlers. Those that hustled and really put everything in, got everything back. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I, I drifted back into the, my, my role of being the background. Like, I, I was comfortable with it. And, and, and I was like, I just want to, I love so much of this stuff. I remember there was a time I literally took so much interest. Like, um, the, uh, the Knot signed with, uh, well, who did they sign with? What is this? West. West. Yes. Wild West. Wild West. Yeah. They signed with Wild West, cause that's, and that's who had um, Ganja and Kishan, too, back in the day. So I, they signed with Wild West. I took that record. I used to DJ, a um, person I knew from back in the day, I used to DJ a poetry reading from these girls um, up on like Melrose and they'd be in these little hipster places. People would read, po it was like a slam, so to speak. People would go read, then I would spin in between. And I took, that was my performance outlet because I could bring the stuff I wanted to play like that nobody had ever heard of. I would drop a track and just watch people react to it, you know what I mean? And I remember the nonce, I had their Wild West, they I had mixtapes and the B-sides, whatever. And I remember at the poetry reading, I'd be like, doo -doo, doo -doo, and people would be like, what is, that? like, you know, heads would start nodding, and I cut it off and be like, y'all ain't ready for that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm, what? You know, and so one of the kids who shows up at one of these poetry readings, he's like an A&R for Deaf American, Rick Rubin's label. He comes up and was like, James, what was that song like the second track you played, I was like, oh, that's my homies. That's the nonce. He's like, what? I never heard it. I was like, dude, take the record. I gave him the Wild West record. A week later, he signed them. So that's how they had Wild West Deaf American. Like I had nothing to do with financially participating in it, but I, I was like, dude, these are my boys. They live down the street from me. Like I was their advocate. Like I want to be your advocate. Like that's how much I love them dudes. I was like, I don't want none of your money. But I want y'all to, the world needs to hear y'all. Like, you know what I mean? Not this little Wild West small stuff. Like, you need to be like on Warner Brothers or whatever. You know, in Deaf America, I was like, Rick Rubin, he'll take care of you. I, I, he was my idol, Rick Rubin. So.